Well, good morning and welcome to South Crest. We are so glad that you are here today joining us. I hope you're having a great day. Uh, I know it's been wonderful weather outside. I've, kind of, I've been enjoying this weather. I hope you guys have as well. Today, we are wrapping up this series we're doing in the book of Galatians. Sorry, not wrapping up. We're close to wrapping it up. All right, we got one more chapter next week. But as we've been walking through this and as we've been looking at it, there's some things that have kind of come to light, some themes. And I want to encourage you today, if you've not already, to spend some time, about 20 minutes maybe this afternoon, and read the book of Galatians all the way through in one sitting. It's a letter. It was written to the church of Galatia, and it was meant to be read at one time. When you get a letter in the mail, you don't read like the first sentence, put it down, go do something else, come back, read the second sentence. You, you read it all the way through. And it's a lengthy letter. Paul was long-winded. I get it. But if you take about 20 minutes to read that through, I think it'll give you a better understanding, a better flow, and a better sense of what's really happening in this entire book. Now, as we look at chapter 5 today, we're going to see some verses that are kind of familiar to us and some things we talk about today that shouldn't be anything new to you. Now, when my kids were growing up, all of them played soccer, and I coached every one of those teams. Um, we wanted our kids to be, we homeschooled, so we wanted our kids to be out in the community, to be active, and, and to, to experience and make friends with other people. So that was one of the ways we accomplished that. Now, some of my kids loved playing soccer. Some of them, not so much. They didn't play that much at all. But uh, as I coached those teams, I always tried to be consistent. I always tried to be the same day in and day out. And, and for me, part of that was coaching the basics. I hate to break it to you, those who love fancy plays and all these type things, that, that don't work, okay? You give me a team that plays the basics, plays them well, plays them with confidence, that they'll win every single day of the week. For, for instance, like, we, we would play teams, and it'd be a corner kick, and they would be an offense on the corner kick, and they'd be like, number three, number two, and the kids would, like, get in these groups, and they'd take off running into the middle, and then they'd kick the ball, and I'm sitting there thinking, okay, if on defense, if you guys play where I told you to play... If you watch the ball like I've told you to watch the ball and you play the ball, you'll win all the time and you won't be tired from running around in circles doing play number three. And so it's just basics, right? And so I taught fundamentals when it came to sports. When it's soccer, it's dribbling, it's passing, it's shooting, it's, it's throw-ins, it's, it's the basics. Here's the thing about that. When you practice the basics, the kids become confident in the basics, they become confident in, in how they move the ball. And here's the thing that most coaches will tell you in any game you ever play, confidence is about 75% of the success in any game that you play. If you don't think you can do it, when the ball comes your way, guess what's gonna happen? You're gonna choke, you're not gonna be able to do it. It's repetition, it's building that confidence that builds that in you. And so that was one of the things I always coached. Now, as I, as I coached, there were things I noticed about how you play the game as well, right? I didn't like playing against teams who played dirty, whose coaches were like, well, you, if you don't get the ball, just get in there and shove them, push them around a bit. I, I don't like that, okay? I, I don't like that type of play. And I would tell our kids, we're not gonna play that way. We're gonna play the way that we would want to be played against. We wanna go play the ball, we wanna play hard, but we don't wanna just go shove and push just because we got beat. We don't wanna shove and push just because we think that's how we win the ball, right? And, and, and another thing is, is sometimes when I had a really good team, you would get up on the score pretty quick. And once I was like, we're going to win this game and we're probably going to win it by a lot, I would begin to rearrange the players, right? So offense would go back on defense, defense would go back on offense, some of the starters would sit, the guys who score like 80 goals a game, they would sit. And it's like, hey, we're going to try to make this fair for the other team so they don't get blown out. And sometimes that worked. Sometimes the team was so bad, it didn't work. You know, I could put a baby in there, they would score on them. I mean, it was just like, oh, sorry, you know, but I, it wasn't, it was obvious to the other team though that we were trying to make it fair and competitive. We were trying to make it where we weren't going to beat them. And, and I was on the other end of that as well. There were some seasons I had teams that were just awful because you never knew what you were going to get when you got a team. And I was just like, I pray we can win one game this season. You know, I mean, it was those type of teams. And so when you're playing the other teams and they start switching out, you're kind of looking over like, thank you. You know, I appreciate it because you don't want to demoralize these kids as they're trying to learn a game. And so Basically, you kind of play a game like you'd want others to play against you, right? And, and, and kind of that idea of what we call the golden rule, right? To, to treat others as you want to be treated. So my question for you today is how do you feel about that? How do you feel about that golden rule? And, and maybe a, a, another question is how do you feel about the way people treat you and does that affect how you treat them in return? Does that affect the way you treat people? And maybe the better question for today is, should that affect the way you treat people? 
And so in Galatians 5 today, we're going to see, see what Paul has to say about that very thing. And we're going to spend some time reading through that. So Galatians 5, verses 13 through 15 says this. For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. So, so Paul has spent the beginning part of this book of Galatians, this letter to this church of Galatia, talking about freedom that comes from knowing Jesus Christ. Freedom in him, what that looks like. You see, with his own blood, Christ purchased, for those who choose to follow him, freedom from slavery to the sinfulness, freedom from being under the law. He, he purchased that with his blood. You see, we're forgiven. We don't need to toil under these burdens that the law places on us. In his letter to Rome, uh, the, the church in Rome, Paul put it this way. He said, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ, Jesus from the law of sin and death. So this raises another question, though, one that I'm sure Paul's enemies asked of him, and I think it's a question that we still ask today, and it's a question that we still struggle with. If there is no threat of condemnation for sinning, then what prevents us from freely sinning, right? If God is going to forgive me, then why not just sin and have fun because God's going to forgive me anyway? And that's the question and the argument that's brought up. And so Paul, Paul's going to confront this idea. He says, don't use this freedom that you have in Christ to do that. That's not what we should do, he said. Instead, you should take this freedom that you have in Christ and use it as an opportunity to serve others, not to serve yourself. You see, whether or not we live for Christ is all about where we place our focus in life. You see, living under the law by definition, is about us trying to justify ourselves before God by our own effort through our own works. We focus on us, and we really seek our own glory as well. We want people to say, man, you were really good at this. Man, you did really good at that. It's all about me. And that moment, when we do that, it's living for us. On the other hand, salvation by faith in Christ, living in the freedom Christ gave us, through his works, it's not about us at all. It's all about God and what God is doing. If the focus then isn't on us, the focus is on him and it's on other people around us. It's all about seeing God's love for us and striving to serve each other with that same type of love. See, Paul's warning the church here and us as well that it's a waste to live and not live in the freedom of Christ and to not do what he's done for us. You see, this idea of just, hey, go, go, go freely sin. Uh, a lot of theologians, they call that a license to sin, all right? That, that we don't have a license to sin. James Bond had a license to kill, and so we think we have a license to sin. Now, some of you who are more theological, you like big, obnoxious words, and so there's a big, obnoxious word for license to sin, and it's licentiousness. So if you ever wanted to like, use that, you can, but I just want to throw that out there for you. There is a big, obnoxious word for this. And so all that comes down to this, we don't have this license to sin, Okay, that's not what scripture's about. It's about living for Christ. Have you ever had a teacher or a boss who, who did a lot for you? Who, who really was there for you? And you found yourself studying more than you might normally study or working harder than you might normally work because you didn't want to let that teacher or boss down? Not because you cared about your grade, but because you cared about how they viewed you. Right? The first guy I worked for at Milliken guy by the name of Paul McClure, fantastic boss, fantastic. He'd get out there and he would do what he said he would do and he defended you. I remember the first time I made a mistake, he chewed me out, but after that, he chewed everybody else out who came at me. He was like, he works for me, he protected me. Man, I, I can work for a guy like that all day long. Somebody who stands in the gap. And because of that, I never would have let him down. I worked harder, worked longer, and did more out of what I, my silo of work was to make sure that he wasn't let down. That's how it should be for Christ. Christ died for us, forgave us of our sins. We shouldn't want to live in sin. If anything, out of a grateful heart, we should want to live in a way that honors him, in a way that, that brings him glory. Our thought process shouldn't be, I hope I don't get caught. Our thought process should be, I hope I don't let God down today. 
because we love him that much. You see, when we sin in our lives, we're really only causing emptiness and strife in our own lives. When you sin, it, even if you're forgiven, it puts you in this down roll, downward spiral. You begin to feel guilt and shame and condemnation and all these type of things that go with it. And that's because we learn in Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is what? Freedom and life and long lasting. No, it's death. For the wages of sin is death. It destroys us. It destroys everything around us. It puts us in this downward spiral we can't get out of. And Paul's saying, hey, church, I don't want you to live enslaved to sin. Because at the end of that Romans 6, it says something else, though, right? It says, but the free gift of God and his eternal life in Jesus Christ, our Lord. See, that's a gift that we have to get to live freely. We have this freedom from sin. We have the freedom to walk in Christ. Not to live in condemnation, not to live in guilt and shame. And Paul begins to change the, 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 the situation here. He says, instead of this law that we've lived under, instead of this constant law that we've been struggling to live under, we're given a new law to live under through Jesus Christ, and that's this one word law called love. We're to love one another. As a matter of fact, Paul's quoting the big man Jesus here when he says this. Jesus said, and I said to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first great and first commandment. And then he went on to say, and the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now the brilliance of this command is obvious. It assumes that we love ourselves. And therefore, if we understand that we love ourselves, then we should love other people the same way that we love ourselves. In other words, I like me. I don't want bad things to happen to me. I love me. And there's a certain way I want to be treated, right? And so since I know what that is, then maybe that's the same way I should treat other people. Because they're a person too, and they probably have similar thoughts that I have. And they probably want to be treated pretty well too. I don't like getting punched in the face. I bet they don't like getting punched in the face. Pretty obvious, right? So let's not punch people in the face. That's, that's how this works. It's not super complicated, y'all. I'm, I'm, I'm not breaking new ground here, okay? This isn't super complicated. So God's saying, if we understand this, what that's doing is it's taking the focus off of me and it's putting the focus on other people around me. In other words, it's helping me to see people the way God sees people. It's loving people. And it's about responding to other people in that love of Christ. Francis Schaeffer put it this way. The Lord calls us all to love people, including those who are enemies of the gospel and those who blaspheme. me. This may not be comfortable and it may not be easy, but this is the gospel of Christ. For he loved his enemies so much that he died to save us. Do you catch the wording there? That Christ loved his enemies so much, who did he die for? Us. Because guess what we were? We were enemies of God. We were in rebellion against him. Christ died for us so we could love other people that same way. We need to use this freedom in a self-sacrificing love. Mark Batterson once put it this way. One way to show someone you love them is to simply get out of your way for them. It is a gift of inconvenience. Loving people is always inconvenient. You know why? Because loving yourself is convenient. This afternoon, when you go home, dads, it's nap time, right? Sunday afternoon naps, that's what happens, right? We sit on the couch, put our feet up, the whole house needs to be quiet or the kids need to go outside so we can take a nap. But maybe your kid needs help with something today. You show them love by inconveniencing yourself and getting up and helping them do something. Loving other people is always inconvenient because loving ourselves is what we want to do. That's the gift that we get to give people. So this love motive will become the replacement for everything that Moses wrote down in the law. And why is this so essential for us who are in Christ? Why is this so essential and important for us? For one thing, any group of people made up of, of other people who serve only themselves will eventually fall into conflict. If every one of us in this room is only focused on us, it results in conflict. It tears relationships apart. Because here's the thing, to have things my way means I either need to ignore what you need in your life or I need to trample you to get what I need in my life. Either way, I'm not showing you any kind of love and it'll tear it apart. Marriages will be destroyed if you think only of yourself. Families will be destroyed if you think only of yourself. 
Friendships will be destroyed if you think only of yourself. It's about focusing on the other people, not on you. James, in his letter, he talked a lot about this idea of worldly wisdom and this focus of ourselves and what it causes. In James 3.16, for where jealousy and self-ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. And in James 4, the first few verses, he says, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder, you covet, and you cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. Listen, Paul is saying this in verse 15. He says, but if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. When we focus on ourselves and serve ourselves, it only causes destruction. It causes fights, it causes bitterness, and eventually it leads to complete separation. So Paul says, I need you to focus on Christ. I need you to focus on him and him alone because that's where things are changed and that's where freedom is truly won. Not only does it lead to greater joy for those in relationship with us, but it releases a greater joy in your own life. You will find in your life that when you follow after Christ, what you think of as sacrificing, what you think of giving, what you think would drain you and make you tired actually fills you. Because God's logic is backwards from the world. God says, if you give love away, I have more enough to fill you back up on. And sometimes the only way we can understand love is to truly give it away in the first place. So where do we go from here, right? Where, where do we... Where do we go this today in this modern age with this idea and head forward? Now, most of you are sitting there thinking, well, all right, Pete, you're talking about the golden rule, doing to others you'd have doing to you, right? Uh, it's pretty simple. I don't know if you need to spend a whole another 15, 20 minutes talking about that. You know what? I agree with you. That would be a waste of our time this morning. C.S. Lewis once put it this way. He said, Christ did not come to preach any brand new morality. The golden rule of the New Testament, do as you'll be done by, is a summing up of what everyone at bottom had always known to be right. Really great moral teachers never do introduce new moralities. It is quacks and cranks who do that. People need to be reminded more often than they need to be instructed. The real job every moral teacher is to keep on bringing us back time after time to the old simple principles, which we're all really so anxious not to see. So this morning, I'm here to remind you of something that you may not want to do because it's inconvenient in your life, to love other people, to, to care for other people more than you care for yourself, right? Right? But in addition to just reminding you of that this morning and kind of bringing it back up in the forefront of your minds, I believe there's something else we need to understand that would help us better appreciate what Paul's saying here. And, and I believe that comes in a way of things that we don't normally talk about, something we need to focus on, and that's about the areas of sin and what sin does to us and how sin affects us. Because I believe there's three areas of sins. I believe there's only three, and I believe these have big impacts on our lives. The first is this, sins against others. Okay, a sin against others is we oftentimes sin, and as a result of our sin, we hurt people around us. It may be people that we love, it may be complete strangers, but our sin causes pain in other people's lives. And when we cause other people pain, it ruins our ability to share Jesus with them. It hampers us to sharing love with them, because what they see of us is not a love giver, but a pain giver, as someone who causes them stress and trial in their life. Now, when you do that, when you sin against others, there's two ways you can deal with that sin in your life when you sin against other people, okay? If you fall under the law, which the Church of Galatia was struggling with, which some of us struggle with, is trying to be good enough to earn God's pleasure, trying to be good enough to earn our way into heaven. If we fall under that mindset, then our response to sin that we cause other people is this, self-justification. Yes, I sinned against them, but they did this to me. They deserved it, right? I'm trying to justify my position. Yes, I may have done something bad, but I only did something bad because they did something bad to me, right? I only punched them because they punched me first. And so we justify ourselves that, hey, my sin really wasn't sin. I was just responding to them and they started it. All of you were kids. All of you got in a fight with somebody. What happened here? They started it, right? That's the first time we say they started it. That's supposed to be just a fake occasion that I was just defending myself. It's okay if I do bad things when I'm defending myself. 
The other alternative is to put it on them and say, they don't understand what I'm trying to accomplish. I really didn't sin against them. They just misunderstood my actions. They just misunderstood what I said. They're actually stupid, and that's their sin is stupidity because I really didn't do anything bad. I just kind of called out the truth, and they got offended. They're just stupid. That's what we do, right? Can I share something with you in a relationship, a marriage, dating relationship? We fall into this, and we don't even know it. We begin to have a conversation, and one of us misunderstands the other, and instead of trying to get to the solution, we begin attacking each other. Well, that's not what I said. You misunderstood me. Can I translate that for you? Husbands especially, can I translate? When your wife says something, you said, that's not what I meant, you misunderstood me. What you're telling her is, you're stupid. You can't follow what I'm trying to lay down here. And you wonder why she hasn't talked to you for a while after. You say, no, you misunderstood me. Because she hears, honey, I think you're an idiot. Okay? So let's not say that. Let's just say, you know what? I probably didn't communicate that well. I'm sorry. That's a different approach. And see, that's the approach we're about to get to. This is the approach that follows Christ's love. And this approach is called forgiveness. You see, the opposite of self-justification is owning up to the sin in our life. It's not interested in why we sinned. It's not interested if we're going to do it again. It's interested in saying, I'm owning up to the fact that I screwed up, that I messed up. This is on me and me alone. It's about being righteous and not about being right. Sometimes you just got to swallow the fact that, you know what, they're not going to understand this, and I'm not going to fight anymore. I love them too much to fight with them. So you know what, I'm going to be righteous and not right. I'm just going to be you know what, it doesn't matter. I was wrong. I didn't communicate that well. I'm sorry. Forgiveness is putting love on other people, not on yourself. Forgiveness is saying, you know what, you matter more to me than I matter to me. And I'm sorry that I hurt you. I'm sorry that I caused you pain. And I need you to understand this today. Because forgiveness is hard. And here's why forgiveness is hard. Because we think forgiveness is an acquittal or a bypass the consequences of sin. So I don't want to forgive you because if I forgive you, you're going to get away with the sin you caused me. It is not. Not at all. Forgiveness is not an acquittal of sin. Allow me to illustrate Back when I uh, started working for Milliken, I was at the Abbeville plant in Abbeville, South Carolina. And this is an old mill. It's been around for a long, long, long time. And uh, we dyed yarn that went to, auto, to go to the knit to make automotive fabric. And so when our undyed yarn came in, we kept it in this older part of the plant that was all wooden. It was a wooden kind of pole barn type structure. And so there was these massive wooden columns that went up to the ceiling. It was these massive wooden beams. That's what held the roof up. And uh, we had a forklift driver one day who uh, wasn't really paying that much attention. He was going in for the yarn, didn't look behind him as he backed up, and, and he bumped into one of those posts. Now, if you've never been around a forklift before, they don't look super huge, but they weigh so much because they have to counterbalance what they're picking up. So a little bump from a forklift goes a long, long way. So he bumped this column, and it actually broke the column in half, and the column would crash into the ground. Now, when the column holding up the roof crashes to the ground, guess what the roof does? It begins to collapse, which is a bad situation. But if it wasn't bad enough, something caught the roof and kept it from falling. You're thinking, that'd be great, right? No, it's not great. What caught the roof and kept it from falling was the main power feed from the substation into the plant. Over 40,000 volts of electricity going through that ceiling, now holding up a roof, all right? Not good at all. I'm telling you, we evacuated that whole area of the plant. It, it was a bad, bad situation. Now, short story long, sorry, long story short. We'll make it brief today. We got the roof fixed. No one got hurt. But there was this forklift driver we had to deal with. We had some rules at Milliken when it came to discipline. But there was a rule when there was a major safety violation, that's automatic termination. For instance, we had a guy drive a forklift off a loading dock and there was no truck there. Yeah, he was fired on the spot, okay? But this guy, we were kind of struggling with it because he was a good worker and he made a mistake. He just wasn't paying attention at the right moment, but that mistake could have caused a lot of people their lives. And so we had to fire that guy. But we decided to do something different. You see, his sin 
And our forgiveness didn't change the fact he had to be fired. But it changed the way we responded to how we fired him. And you're thinking, what? Yes, we fired him nicely, okay? Let me explain firing people nicely. What he did, we couldn't allow him to work there. Everybody in the plant knew the rules. He broke it. They knew he knew what was going to happen to him. As a matter of fact, when he came to talk to me, he was like, I'm done working here, aren't I? And I was like, uh, yeah, yeah, it's going to be bad. So I walk him up to HR. Why we're having the conversation to do that, two of our HR assistants are on the phones with local companies seeing if they're hiring. We fired him with two job interviews that afternoon that we had set up on his behalf. Now, I don't ever know which job he took or whatever the situation. But it changed us and how we, that's what forgiveness does, it changes you. It changed how we viewed him. It made a difference in his life. Because we said, hey, we're not gonna leave you high and dry. Even though what you did, hey, you, you gotta be fired for this. See, you, your consequences of your actions gotta be paid for. But we forgive you at the same time. And forgiveness and love does something different and that's what we need to do. See, I need you to understand this today. When we don't respond in love, when we don't respond in forgiveness, when we act in self-justification, when we push back against other people, we become a stumbling block. Francis Chan once said this, we need to stop giving people excuses not to believe in God. They're watching you. Everybody's watching you, just so you know. When you least expect it, people are watching you. When you expect it, they're watching you. And how you respond as a Christian, as someone who they know, you go around, hey, I go to church, I do this, I do this, I do this. They know that's about you, they're watching you. And how you respond to those situations in your life either draws them closer to Christ or pushes them farther away. And we need to stop giving people excuses to not follow Christ. But following Christ looks like that, that's not for me. No, following Christ needs to look different. How we treat people says more about what we believe than what we actually say. We have to learn to love people. The second area of sin we have to deal with is sin against ourselves. That's right. We sin more against ourselves than against other people. See, we're to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. The problem is, if you don't love yourself, you won't know how to love other people. And when you sin against yourself, you begin to talk bad about yourself. We begin to think bad things about ourselves. We think, I'm too dumb, I'm too slow, I'm too tall, I'm too short, I'm too fat, I'm too skinny. And we begin to believe this negative speak about us. And if we feel that way about us, look, if I'm not happy with who I am, then how can I encourage somebody who's going through a hard time? If I don't think I'm smart enough and someone's struggling with a problem, Man, I can't help you. I'm an idiot. That's not self-love. Self-love is not about pride either. It's not about puffing yourself up and thinking you better than you really are. John prayed this a few bits ago. He didn't know what I was going to say, but he prayed this anyway because God was moving and God said, I got something for you. Self-love is this. Self-love is believing who God says you are. Self-love is believing that you're chosen, that you're accepted, that you're adopted into a family. Self-love is about believing you're more than conquerors. Self-love is about believing that God is always there for you. Those promises are there for you. Self-love is God saying, no matter what happens in your life, I love you, no cap. That is self-love. It's deep. It's not rooted in us. It's rooted with Christ within us. And when we learn to love ourselves that way, then when someone says something bad about themselves or struggling, we don't go to them and say, well, I got it figured out. No, hey, Christ in me loves you. Christ in me is there for you. Christ in me can help you. I can love you as I love myself because Christ in me loves me and shows me what that looks like. We have to live that way. Because when we find ourselves in a place where we've sinned against ourselves, and we've made a bad choice, and it's hurt only us, we have two responses, and they're the same as the responses for the others. We can either justify our own behavior, or we can ask God to forgive us. And more importantly, and what most of us don't do, because it's extremely hard, is to forgive yourself. You have to forgive yourself. 
And it can't just be an assumption that you made that, oh, yeah, I did that. No. Have you really forgiven yourself? If you keep thinking about that same thing over and over again, you haven't forgiven yourself. Forgiving yourself is about letting it go. Just like Elsa said, let it go. You have to step into that moment and say, you know what? Christ said I'm more than this. Therefore, I'm gonna live that way. Now, the last area of sin that we deal with is sins against God. <laughs> and I'm gonna tell you something here. In reality, the first two sins I talked about really aren't sins at all because all sin is this. All sin is sin against God. The sins against others, the sins against ourselves, that's just collateral damage from when we sin against God. You see, sin often harms other people, but it always hurts God when we sin. David, when he sinned, listen to what he says. He said, against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Bottom line, you can only really sin against the person who created the law in the first place. God created the law. Therefore, only God can be sinned against. Yes, there's collateral damage. Yes, we hurt other people in the process. But our sin and moral law begins with God. You see, we're created in his image. And when we sin, we put a stain on that image. You see, sin is a perversion of God's perfect design for your life. We're called to be image bearers of Christ, a reflection, a mirror of who Christ is. And when we sin, we put big blots on that mirror. And we make it harder for people to see the reflection of Christ in us because that sin is there. That's not against us, that's against God that we do that. We step outside of the purpose for which God created us, that process. We violate God's moral law and we are accountable to him and him alone. Romans 3.23, most of you know this verse, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Sin is anything that keeps us from meeting what God had for our lives. Sin that brings us short every single time. So whether it's us, someone else, ultimately, it's God who we're sinning against. And it's God where we go for forgiveness. So what would happen today if we started living by this golden rule? If we started treating other people like we wanted to be treated? If we started loving people the way we wanted to be loved? What would happen? How would that change your friendships? How would that change your family? How would that change your community? Oswald Chambers once said, the golden rule is not intellect, but obedience. We've talked about this already in this series. It's not about what you know up here. It's about what you do through here. Knowing's not enough, right? It's about going out and actually doing it. Because here's the thing about the golden rule. It doesn't have a reciprocity clause, right? It doesn't say, if you do this for me, I'll do that for you. As a matter of fact, there's no guarantee that people we love will ever love us back. There's no guarantee the way we treat people will ever be returned to us. The bully at school gave you swirlies, took your lunch money, tripped you in the hall. There's no guarantee when you love that person, treat them with respect, that they're gonna stop picking on you. There's no guarantee. But God didn't call you to change other people. God called you to change yourself. God called you to be more like him, not to make somebody else more like him. That's who we control, us. Our responses, our reactions, that's on us. And those actions matter because why? Because people are watching. People see it. You know, you may never change that bully who's doing all that to you, but you may change somebody else who says, wow, look how they respond when that happens to them. I wish I could respond that way. The one day they come up to you, hey, how come you respond that way? Let me, let me tell you about my Jesus, right? Let me tell you. We are called to go make disciples. And how we do that matters. Dwight L. Moody once said, the world does not understand theology or dogma, but it understands love and sympathy. I can talk to you until you die. And it could not, it not have any difference in your life whatsoever. But if I have compassion, if I love you, if I sacrifice myself for you, that'll change you. That, that'll do something. Look, it's not easy. Lord knows it's not easy. And we can't do it alone. We need, we need God's help. 
As I said earlier, it's Christ in us that makes that happen. It's not by my might, not by my power. It's by his power. So let's ask him to step into our lives today and help us begin changing us so we can change others with the love of Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, I love the fact that your word is so simple. God, it's so clear that we're to love others as we love ourselves. But God, even though that it sounds so simple, God, doing it is so much harder. And so God, we turn to you today. God, I ask you to help us. God, first and foremost, I ask that you help us to love ourselves. God, there's a lot of self-hate out there. There's a lot of false humility that's really just self-deprivation. God, I pray that you help us to love other people, no matter how they treat us. Because God, it's easy to love people who love us back. But God, that's not what you called us to do. God, you called us to love those who are broken and hurting and hard to love. But God, we can do that because you did that for us. And God, loving ourselves, loving others, it all stems from loving you first and foremost. God, you said with all of our heart, with all of our mind, with all of our soul, with all of our strength. So today, that's our prayer. God, help us to love you that way. God, so that we can be more like you. God, so we can see people like you see people. God, so we can love people like you love people. God, we can treat people like you treat people. God, let it be less about us, more about you each and every day. And God, if anyone here doesn't have that kind of relationship with you, God, I pray today would be a day that they would say, I'm tired of doing it my way because it only leaves me feeling pain, guilt, sorrow, shame. I'm not getting anything accomplished. And God, let them turn it all over to the freedom that's found in you. God, let's walk with you. God, let us be influenced by your love. God, that we might change the world one relationship at a time. Thank you so much for loving us, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.